All right, this is the Armstrong Strail catfish section, which is the northernmost section, which you have to take Route 68 northeast of East Brady to a right turn, or no, a left turn, onto Sarah Furnace Road, head down a steep mountain, and then when you get to the first turn at the bottom, you find this parking lot on the left. Here you go. I'm going to head what would be south on the Armstrong Trail toward a tunnel. Uh and uh, repeat what I did a week ago. Over 20 seconds. the alligator. Overlook 
side of the river. Sometimes you can see all the boats up in the river. I would say four or five miles probably up the Alabama River is visible from the overlook. And I always seem to get there right at sunset. Just a beautiful time to be up at the Brady's Bend overlook. I believe in western Pennsylvania. So when you get looking up in the pier, maybe even 100 yards of these tunnels, you can feel the cold air blowing on in the winter, and you can feel the warm air. In the winter, a lot of the snow might be melted, depending on just how. Although icicles do tend to form in the tunnels in the winter, which is the reason we should be in the winter. Um, the question is to show you why you should be in the winter. They're actually actively fixing this tunnel up right now, so I'm wondering if they haven't gotten the funding and maybe they're going to turn this, uh, finish this up and get this into the bike trail. But you can see the stonework, um, just amazing stonework here. And uh, the water's dripping through, and you got, you got a skylight hole there, and that's collapsed. There's trees and stuff up there. Rocks have fallen through. There was actually a pile of rocks in here just a week ago, and it's now gone. So, uh, thank you to yeah, whoever, I guess, is funding this uh, project and the good construction work. Hopefully, one of these days, we'll be able to ride through this tunnel. Nice rock out props up there. Actually, I've never been to the other side of the tunnel, but to be consistent with what I lost in the video and I'm going to record here, there's a bypass hiking trail which I'm going to take my eyes on. It's maybe a quarter mile. Here. Here the 
forms the headwaters of the Ohio River here in western Pennsylvania. It originates in near Cloudersport or Coudersport, Pennsylvania, runs through Port Allegheny, goes north into New York, through the Seneca Nation, Indian Reservation up there, around Allegheny State Park, Salamanca, Olean, goes back down, and I believe, into the town of Port Allegheny, and uh, Maybe Port Allegheny is actually on the other side when it comes back into Pennsylvania. It kind of goes over route. It's 346 and 421 or something along those lines. Near where the North Country Trail runs. And um, forms a big giant lake that actually extends into New York. It's got to be 40 or 50 miles long called the Allegheny Reservoir. Other boats and whatnot. Probably a mile or two wide. Um, the part of New York is really beautiful. It's got lots of um, lots of sandbars, and it's just kind of like the Allegheny River is just really wild. So that's the upper Allegheny River. Then as you come down into Utica, Pennsylvania, near Warren and the Kinzer Dam, off U.S. or Pennsylvania Route 59, you're, as you're going south, you would enter into the Middle Allegheny River, which this is a part of the Middle Allegheny River, which encompasses all of the portions of the Allegheny River beyond the last lock and dam, the last lock being lock number nine, which I'm hoping to ride past later tonight. Lock nine is near a few miles south of East Brady. Um, there's about 11 miles of backwater above lock nine where motorboats can safely pass. Um, that area, I guess, is the navigable portion of the Allegheny River is defined where channels greater than nine feet exist. Um, at one point, maybe still today, but much less so, the barges carrying coal needed to get up the Allegheny River. So the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Pittsburgh Region, or whoever may have preceded them, I think it was all built by the Army Corps of Engineers, put in um, a series of eight, I believe, locks, creating nine pools in the Allegheny River, um, starting with number two in Pittsburgh, and then of course ending with number nine. So once you hit lock number nine, you are in the lower Allegheny River, which is the flood controlled navigable portion. And that's about, oh, I can't remember if it was 70 miles or something, and it runs into Pittsburgh, where it connects with the Monongahela River to form the Ohio River. So, according to the Seneca Nation, um, this is the Ohio River. I think it's pronounced the Hoyo or something, um, if you go up into uh, New York along Route 86. So we are on the headwaters of the Ohio River up here in the Middle Allegheny River. Kind of going a little bit further around the uh, bend that forms the landform known as Brady's Bend, which is also a township. And I'm Sean Coveney. So my biggest aspiration out of making these videos is hopefully to weave in a uh, adventure and to get you guys inspired and wanting to come out and visit these beautiful areas in Pennsylvania and maybe support some of the work uh, via either trail work contributions or whatever for the groups that are you know making these different trails possible and uh, just to live a healthier lifestyle and uh, if you're interested in history and stuff there's just so much history in these places um, that are rails to trails which Pennsylvania has more than any other state in the nation by I think maybe two times more there's over 2,100 miles, I believe, in rails to trails in Pennsylvania, and uh, we still have a ton of active rail lines. Uh, a lot of times you'll have a rail trail on one side of the river and an active train line on the other side. So coal is still being actively carried through um, the state. Um, some of the rural areas even have, you know, coal burning stoves and whatnot, and generally that's not happening around the bigger cities for obvious uh, air quality reasons. Our uh, bituminous coal in western Pennsylvania is known as for having a very high sulfur content. It has high uh, BTU levels also. Um, pretty close to what you get in anthracite, just a little bit below anthracite, which is the real clean burning, hard, glassy, shiny coal that's abundant in northeast Pennsylvania. Northeast Pennsylvania has um, most of the world's supply of anthracite coal as far as I know and that's that's a very unique 
regional thing. I was just out that way uh, a few days ago out in the Poconos and uh, spent a few more days out there about three weeks ago. But that's your um, highly metamorphosed, very uh, clean burning, high energy coal. And this coal uh, here, it's a little dirtier and a lot of times it gets mixed with anthracites or when it gets sent to the power plants like in uh, Homer City and at one point that uh, Templeton, or not Templeton, but uh, the Reesdale super stack um, down near Templeton across the Allegheny River, I believe, was a coal-fired power plant. So they would have been burning some of the uh, local coal. And I think that they use, uh, use some very good scrubbers, of course, to meet the uh, environmental regulations. And part of the reason in the old days why the super stacks were built which I believe is refers to any of the smokestacks that are over a thousand feet tall, that one being like a thousand and thirteen feet high, um, was that they wanted to put all the sulfur dioxide and all the nasty uh, compounds high enough into the atmosphere, <laughs> you know, so that it wouldn't be a nuisance to people on the ground for air quality reasons. Because long ago, I mean, in the 40s and before the 1940s. Pittsburgh and a lot of western Pennsylvania was known for having just some horrendous air quality and I believe uh, London England possibly was well known for having you know the good old stories you hear about London fog that was actually a like a sulfuric acid fog created by pollution and um, the stories that go with Pittsburgh that the street lights would come on in the day uh, back in the old days because the smoke was just so bad it's now been known by many names, the City of Bridges, the Steel City, the City of Champions. Um, it was a smoky city at one point, <laughs> and uh, for good reason. And when I remember, as a kid in the 1980s, I just remember acid rain um, being a very big issue. Rain that came down with a pH of three and a half. And it wasn't just Pittsburgh. The rain was across the entire state of Pennsylvania, and most of the waterways were uh, dead to aquatic life and fish. And a lot of um, restocking and different things have taken place since then, and environmental regulations have really changed our uh, sulfuric acid rain that we used to get just 30, 35 years ago. Um, thank goodness. So... The goal here, I guess, at least with that stack in Reesdale, is that they've been talking about imploding that stack and demolishing it for probably the last 15 years. I remember when that was an active power plant. People would fish around the outflow from it because it would churn up all the water, but it's no longer uh, active. It's been dormant for quite a while. So here you got what looks like some relatively clean water, a little bit orange. I'm not sure if that's because the clay is orange or if it actually is iron containing uh, AMD mine discharge. Oh. So you may notice I go from topic to topic too. I apologize for that before I get back to finish a thought. But this is about where this trail ends. You can see it doesn't go very far. This is a hiking trail. I'm not really sure if anyone bothers to go through the jungle up there and make it through. I'll turn around right now and head back and ride the uh, north section of the catfish, uh, call it the catfish extension of the Armstrong Trail. Until it's connected to the main Armstrong Trail, this area will be known as the catfish extension, at least in my video, or as I refer to it. Trails or rails to trails, uh, as they may be called. 
um, and the hiking trails that spur off of them. Now this actually seems like it might have been an alternate. I don't know if people probably bicycled back here a little bit, but um, some trails, like say the Toby Clarion Trail, which I have to release a video on, I've recorded the uh, contents and haven't put the video out yet. There's actually at least three or more really, really nice hiking trails that come off of that trail, because some of these uh, bicycle trails, they go in, I mean, really the most beautiful areas, because you think about where um, rail lines were created. They had to um, be built such that the the land was pretty level, so they tended to follow the contour of the land, and they tended to be built down by rivers. And they'd go into these places where um, really nothing else would be built. You know, you'd have a steep mountainside, and then you'd have the river, and you'd level a plot of ground long enough to run a uh, rail line. Some of them were narrow gauge, some of them were standard gauge, um, just so they could uh, get the resources through to the different little towns. And, uh, Unlike uh, some states like, I don't know, say Ohio and stuff, where um, you have decently large centers of population scattered sort of throughout the state and at it various distances, and you're never really way out in the, in the sticks, kind of out in the country. Um, Pennsylvania was settled in the east, kind of out by Philadelphia, and then uh, everything sort of jumped over to the western edge of the state. So what you have in the middle of the state is a lot of little towns and uh, kind of very rural, very scenic uh, places that are kind of isolated and not near any big cities. And it's uh, had to get things out of those places. <clears throat> and that's, uh, they were probably, a lot of those towns were probably actually built to serve and support the rail lines or various... Uh, historical reasons we're still there today and it kind of creates a situation where we have one of the more populous states in the country but it's still really kind of wild and scenic in a lot of places because um yeah places are kind of concentrated together and then you have these big wild areas that are kind of untouched hopefully it'll stay that way or maybe they were touched a long time ago like say up in the northwestern corner of the state um everything was lumbered and like, just denuded of trees but people realized that <laughs> that wasn't sustainable when there were no trees left and so the whole area has been replanted or whatever and you know taken over with second growth and if you go into the northwest part of the state now i mean it's beautiful it's all like any national forest it's you know everything that people love about the wild sort of natural setting but a lot of that was completely deforested 150 years ago for that reason old growth forest is extremely rare and when you see it, it's just like you never forget it because I'm sure if you've been out west or if you're watching this and you live in the western part of the U.S., I mean, there's plenty of old growth forest out there, but it's not so common in the east. And we've got a few uh, tracks of it at various points and you just kind of walk into the woods and it's like, yeah, it's just all of a sudden kind of gets more quiet and open and just gigantic, enormous trees, at least by eastern standards. <clears throat> but uh, part of the lure of sort of all the uh, old rail lines and everything going through the mountainous country is you have these rail tunnels and they're just everywhere. There's just so many old rail tunnels. And um, in order to make these rails to trails uh, viable and sort of fully connected, they have to do a lot of uh, refurbishing and, and fixing up of the uh, rail tunnels that have been neglected for half a century, sometimes more, um, to get them up to code and engineering standards for uh, safety reasons. A place where you can see a lot of, um, where a lot of progress has been done and the rail tunnels have all been repaired and connected as of like the mid-2000s is the Great Allegheny Passage Trail, which is our 
was our longest trail, I guess, in Pennsylvania, but the Delaware and Lehigh Trail has taken over. But the Great Allegheny Passage may still be part of the longest trail network in the country, even longer than the Katy Trail when it connects to the CNO Trail, which it does, and then that in turn connects to the Montour Trail on the north. So you're talking well over 400 miles of interconnected bike trail um, that can take you from kind of northwest of Pittsburgh all the way to Washington, D.C. Oh gosh, at least four or five good rail tunnels on that trail that are just really neat. And they kind of have some bends in them and different shapes. You got the, uh, uh, the Pinkerton Tunnel, which is like going through a big piece of sheet metal. I've only went there once. You got the big Savage Tunnel, which is like a giant kind of uh, light bulb, like an old light bulb from the 1800s, almost like it sort of arches out a little. Um, like a big doorway type thing with a traditional keystone uh, rock work around the entrance. It's lit up inside. Um, I think a lot of them, almost all of them, I think they have a bend in there, so it's kind of neat. It'll get really dark. Um, there is a... I'm thinking there's a few other ones. I can't remember them. I know down in Maryland on the CNO Canal Trail, though, they have the Pawpaw Tunnel and some other ones down there. Tangents because that's what I like to do. Took the cross and now back. It was literally last Sunday, almost at this exact same time I was here. Maybe just a little bit later. So I'm hoping to sort of do what I did in reverse. I did the other section down by uh, East Brady uh, earlier last Sunday and then came here. But because this is further, I figured I'm gonna knock this out of the way while I can. So we get back on the bike. Try to get a seamless uh, piece here. Put the camera on, or the phone in my bike. Have a nice uh, little phone holder called by made by some place or group max miles or whatever. It's made of good dirt and I don't know. I think it's an alloy or something. It's not cheap plastic. I hate cheap plastic uh, things that just break. And it's kind of one of the gripes I have about it. A lot of stuff broke on the next thing. Decent cameras. And then they sell all these uh, accessories that only really work with GoPro cameras that are junk. The price is high as good durable accessories that you get with almost any other camera, but I can't think of other junk accessories. This charge a little more makes something good. So I uh, I'm a lot of my way to buy something durable that I don't have to replace all the time. So this goes back to the phone line. So last time, uh, last week, there was a section of some down trees that I could get through. A little further, and then there was uh, more down trees and a fence, so I assume that's where the end of the trail is at this point. Now, I think in the grand scheme of things, uh, ideally this trail might connect to the Oregon River Trail much further, and a little further north. Um, and when that happens, if it happens, it'll so kind of come to the great part of it. You need to put the also trails corridor, I don't know if they're calling it, but it's kind of just uh, I guess the rest of the trails I'll be all doing it on one trip. I'll be able to have these trails come up with Mary. And uh going for it when you do the bigger screen for the time to run it over a lot. But yeah, there's trails obviously across the border. Uh, if you've got all the way to Canada, which there is a proposed trail that's going to run from Mary to Buffalo. Along current US Route 5. So then when you get to Canada, you have the Bruce Trail, which is a hiking trail that goes all the way to Tilburn, which is like 500 miles north in the uh, Georgian Bay area. But for the bike trail, you have the Niagara River something trail. I don't know, it goes through Niagara Falls, Ontario. And some really nice areas there. I made a video, I think it's about over a thousand years, years ago, uh, of that trail. I that trail is just kind of good in the area between the 
last time in the measurements of the people stories that can be seen for the back here at the front. Or anything down here, any fuel houses and whatnot that look like they're not going to occupy any of them at all. And the past the bridge can be turned on. Sarah Furness Road. I'm not going to show where Sarah Furness itself is because usually that refers to a coke oven and furnace, uh, usually sort of a pre Civil War era. ago they did that. Now they've opened it up to male names, which seems only proper and right. It's been made against your hurricane. There's a fence structure where it looks like the Armstrong Trail comes to an end.
Mm-hmm. <laughs> 